tonight. Um, we want to warmly welcome you to this evening. I think uh, you're going to be very pleased that you came out on a rainy night uh, for an uh, extremely interesting talk by a passionate and innovative individual who has a lot to say uh, about uh, this particular area uh, of poverty alleviation. So uh, I want to uh, have Larry Swadek, our program director for the Bachelor of Environmental Studies and International Development, uh, who knows Paul well to introduce him. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about uh, Larry. Uh, uh, Larry's a colleague of about a year, year and a half. Uh, we we're fortunate uh, that he returned from 10 years or more in Africa, a uh, lot in Botswana and some other countries, but mainly in Botswana where he taught, developed programs and uh, conducted a good deal of research uh, in the area uh, and in uh, South Africa. Uh, he returned to the East Coast, uh, I think, to uh, acquire, to lick his wounds, uh, I guess, and uh, uh, not write his memoirs just yet, uh, find love and uh, retool and rethink, and, and he just happened to come back to Canada uh, at the right time uh, for the launch of our international development program and environment uh, to lead it uh, and implement it and improve it. Uh, so we we're extremely fortunate uh, at the university and the faculty of environment and at St. Paul's that um, we uh, were able to bring him here to take the lead in that area. Uh, Larry has uh, conducted, uh, attracted a lot of research grants and uh, done a good deal of, of research in uh, water rights and many other uh, areas, but uh, what I was fascinated me when I read his CV is that some interesting titles to his research. Uh, uh, he um, has some sort of, sort of straightforward stuff like uh, contending theories of international relations uh, in his publication uh, a list. Uh, Transcrowded boundary water governance uh, in the Okavango River Basin, for example. But also things like barking up the wrong tree, tropical forest loss and violent crime in Africa, or the interesting uh, paper which I, I still have to read, The Brothers Grimm, Modernity and International Relations in Southern Africa. And I think those are fascinating uh, titles. And if you look through his list of publications, uh, um, they are uh, pithy and poignant and relevant and contemporary uh, is the work that uh, he does. So again, um, I'd like to, you to warmly welcome our Program Director of International Development, Larry Swadek, who will introduce Paul uh, for the evening's lecture. Larry. Hi, everybody. Um, I think what Graham meant was that I had too much time on my hands in the bushes. <laughs> when I should have been doing things more practical, I was busy uh, writing. Um, practical, uh, determined, creative, and, uh, and uh, socially responsible. I like to think that's what defines uh, our, inter our approach to international development in this uh, new program that we have. Um, and last year, I had the good fortune to meet Paul Pollock at the, engineer, the annual meeting of the Engineers Without Borders Congress in Toronto. And uh, it was a packed house like this one, although the house was quite a bit bigger. Um, he came with his props and you know, his you know, doohickeys that you're going to see tonight also. Um, and he, well, he was and remains uh, an engaging speaker, but when I listened to him, I thought that you know, this is somebody that I want to work with because uh, he is, I think, practical, um, creative, determined, su stubborn maybe? No, no, I don't have any of that. Okay, determined and, <laughs> and socially responsible. And uh, when we had, we were looking, we're launching, we're launching SEED tomorrow, the School for Environment, Enterprise and Development. And uh, as many of you know, uh, we were casting around for a star-studded uh, group of people to come and, and, uh, and launch this thing. And, and the first name that came to my mind was Paul Polak. And I uh, chased after him uh, through his, uh, through his uh, network of, uh, of, of uh, uh, handlers and confidants, um, finally got him. Uh, and uh, find out, of course, that he's from here anyway, so he would have probably come for a lot 
lower fee if I would have really just held out a little bit longer. Um, uh, so, uh, but I, I, I really think that, uh, you know, the bringing Paul here uh, to this program is a meeting of, a meeting of minds. Um, his book, Out of Poverty, that many of you know, uh, which is on sale for the low, low price of twenty six twenty five. There may or may not be a student discount. I'm not sure. Um, is is it comes at, a, at an exact time when we really we really need it. Uh, practical solutions uh, for uh, a deeply distressed uh, planet. The, the other side of it is that he also uh, is not a policy wonk. You know, he doesn't fly around the world attending all of these meetings and making great proclamations and saying we're committing uh, people to do things and then not doing anything. He actually uh, is interested in, uh, in, in innovations and, and solutions for, for the 90% of the planet that, no, that most people think are, are a burden and a cause of global warming and et cetera, et cetera. Um, wrongly so, and rightly so, Paul sees the bottom 90 as a uh, as an entrepreneurial, untapped uh, uh, mass that face certain kinds of um, structural barriers that if you just tweak things a little bit, uh, if you open a few doors, then a flood of activity and innovation and, and uh, positive outcomes results. So um, that's what we're all about uh, at, the, at St. Paul's University College, at the Faculty of Environment in the International Development Program. And uh, um, that's what I believe uh, Paul Pollock is also all about. And it um, gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce him to you today. So would you please welcome uh, here uh, for the first time, and I hope the first of many times, uh, Paul Pollock. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Larry. It's, it's really great to be here. I, uh, as Larry said, I grew up in Millgrove, which is six miles north of Hamilton on the number six highway towards Guelph, two and a half miles north of Clappison's Corners. It's a village of 300 or 400 people now. It's more of a bedroom community. I haven't been back as much. And, and uh, I got my medical degree at Western. So. First of all, uh, I love interacting rather than just giving a talk. That said, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. Uh, you can uh, get a copy of the PowerPoint, so don't worry too much about taking notes. Uh, but feel free to challenge me at any point, and then uh, uh, hopefully we'll have a good discussion afterwards. By way of introduction, uh, just to give you a little summary of, I've been doing this kind of work for 28 years. Uh, 25 years ago, I started an organization called International Development Enterprises. It's a nonprofit development organization that operates like a business. Uh, it treats poor people, by that I mean people who live on less than a dollar a day, as customers instead of as recipients of charity. And it's been very successful by activating the marketplace to help dollar-a-day farmers double and triple their income from farming. And over 25 years, uh, it's helped some 17 million uh, dollar-a-day farmers move out of poverty, which is still just a drop in the bucket. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. I also, uh, two years ago, handed over IDE's uh, leadership to Al Dirksen, who's a Canadian, who's been on the board for a long time, and now I've started two other organizations. One is called DREV for Design Revolution, and the other is Windhorse International. DREV, I its mission as a nonprofit is to foment a revolution in design in the world to reach the other 90%. And Windhorse's mission is to demonstrate that you can make attractive profits in a for-profit international business serving customers who live on less than two dollars a day. So that's a brief summary. I'll steam through some, some uh, information and, and, and some of the things that 
we've done and I believe in, but uh, in, the, in the talk that I gave that you talked about uh, in Toronto, we were lucky to have a couple of other people to get involved. Uh, one of them is Jerry Dick, uh, and the other guy is the head of uh, IDE uh, Canada. He isn't here. He did the, uh, the, the little exercise routine on the treadle pump. Uh, but it turns out that Jerry Dick is here. His wife, Evie, is uh, sitting back there. And Jerry was the first uh, person who went with me 28 years ago now to start a program in Somalia. At that time, he was the age of many of you here. You were how old, Jerry? 24. 24? I thought it was 26. Is, has it gone down? <laughs> as, uh... <laughs> Jerry was 24, so I... Uh... I'd like to call on Jerry uh, to tell you a little bit about his experience getting involved in IDE's first project and eventually leading it. Starting uh, an international development organization like IDE sounds uh, glamorous and um, world travel and all of that. Um, I, I'm going to tell you uh, how it actually happened. I was a college graduate, and I was painting grain elevators in Alberta, and I got a call one day from a fellow named Paul Pollack. He said, you don't know me, um, but I understand you're interested in uh, international development. I said, well, yes, I am. He said, well, we have a mutual friend. His name's Art Fair. He's just been selected to be the UN High Commissioner to Somalia, and Somalia was, was just coming out of a war with Ethiopia. And uh, he's been named the High Commissioner for Refugees, and um, I would like to start an organization that uses business principles, but would essentially work as a multinational for international development. Um, if you're interested, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go to Somali, and you can meet me at the Toronto airport on October the 4th. So I, uh, quit my summer job uh, as a grain elevator painter, and it was getting on in the season anyway, and you shouldn't be painting uh, after about mid-September. The, the paint tends to uh, flake off the wall, and you're gonna be back next year doing the warranty job. So um, I went home, and I uh, got an, I, I came to Ontario, because I'm from the Niagara area, got an atlas uh, to see where Somalia is. <laughs> And uh, I told my parents, I'm uh, going to uh, Somalia, and I'm working for a guy I've never met. And I'll be working for an organization named IDE that doesn't yet exist. Um, <laughs> and it's in a country that I've just barely heard of, and we don't have a contract yet, so there is no salary, but I am excited. <laughs> <laughs> my parents said very little. Uh, <laughs> I um, had a few savings because my summer job was a good job. It was high paying. Um, it was dangerous work, and so we got a little extra cash. And I paid three thousand dollars for a plane ticket to Somalia. And on October fourth, in 1984, I met Paul <coughs> at the airport, and we went to Somalia together. It was called Malton Airport then. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we met at the Alitalia counter. And we didn't have visas for Somalia, so we, we were going through Rome uh, because uh, um, the Italians had tried to colonize Somalia, but you don't colonize Somalia. And uh, th they had uh, the Somali embassy, um, and, and we went there and uh, got visas, and we got to the embassy, we needed pictures, so we went down the street to a little, uh, one of the little kiosks where you put in a couple of coins and you stick your face in, and then it takes pictures. And then we went back to the Somali embassy and, and got our visas, got back on an airplane and went to Somalia. And we were there for uh, about a, a, a month. I was there for six weeks. Paul was there for about three weeks. <coughs> and uh, the UN High Commissioner gave us a jeep, and we bounced around the refugee camps looking for income generation projects. Uh, the idea being that if uh, people have been sitting and waiting and waiting for the war to end uh, with uh, receiving handouts each day, and they are people that are actually independent and very, very capable, but are unable to go to their, 
to, to their normal way of generating income um, because of war and so on. This is a very big problem. And so they asked us, could we do some income generation? Well, in the semi-arid desert that is Somalia, income generation, uh, is, as you can imagine, is very difficult. And so after a few weeks, we selected some projects that we thought would work. But uh, Paul, being a, a doctor and me being a college student, uh, uh, we we were, were looking at um, these kind of things through inexperienced eyes, and um, we selected four projects, as I recall, Paul. One was windmills. One was making mud bricks in order to do construction. Uh, one was very simple plastic extrusion, very, very basic, taking whatever plastic was there, melting it down, and creating something else out of it. And the uh, fourth project was donkey carts. Then we came back to Canada and we wrote a project proposal and brought it to CEDA, Canadian International Development Agency in Ottawa. Paul went to Denver and I went to Ottawa with our proposal because the UN uh, High Commissioner had indicated we needed to have some funding from our, from, from our country, either Canada or US, and then the UN uh, was willing to consider contributing as well. So I went to Ottawa. And again, not knowing that you don't do this, I called the desk officer for Somalia and said, I need to meet you. We're going to do a project uh, with this organization that we want to start in Somalia. And we need $100,000 because we think the project is about $300,000. UN has indicated they, they would come to the table with some funding. And uh, we need $100,000. He said, I'm very busy this week. I said, uh, that's all right. Um, I can come Saturday. He said, well, I'm not at the office on Saturday. That's all. I said, that's all right. I'll come to your home. <laughs> and so I did. And he accepted that. And he uh, sat on his uh, sofa and uh, listened to my uh, spiel. And then at the end of it, he said, uh, we would be willing to consider this. Um, and uh, I left uh, kind of on, on cloud nine, not realizing that, once again, you just don't do those kinds of things. We got the grant and uh, went back to Somalia uh, uh, early in the new year. I'm thinking it was January 2nd or 3rd. Most of the projects that we had chosen were politically very volatile. Uh, the only one that wasn't was the donkey carts. And I could go into a long spiel about why they were volatile, but I, I won't. Um, however, the donkey carts were an insult in a way. The UN community and the administration uh, thought, we really don't need you guys here to tell us about donkey carts. Donkey carts have been in Somalia for a very, very long time. And why do we need you here to build donkey carts? Um, as a side note, they, they did need us. Uh, we needed to re-engineer the donkey carts. Sometimes uh, some of the donkey carts, uh, when you loaded too much behind the axle because they weren't really balanced. The donkey slowly came up off the ground oh. and, uh, and the animals were, were injured uh, because of uh, not, not having a good understanding of, of how to hitch animals onto carts and those kind of things. So there's some very basic engineering. And there was also some production and distribution issues that we thought we could contribute to. Uh, we at that time were incorporated in the United States, we were not incorporated in Canada, and we were having trouble getting the name IDE because it was already chosen by other organizations. IDE USA was available, but IDE Canada was not. One of our board members suggested that maybe we call our organization Asthall International. Uh, we we uh, didn't go with that name, we went with IDEA. Uh, and, and, uh, and that worked until we were able to secure the name IDE Canada. When we got to Somalia, um, while the UN was somewhat willing to go along with our project, the um, High Commission for Refugees was not, and they refused to sign. Uh, we said that was all right, we would wait. Um, and so we went every day to the High Commissioner's office. We took turns, because it was kind of a depressing uh, process. Paul would go one day, I would go the next day, and we sat in their offices and we waited. And after three months they signed. Mm. Um, at that point I was down about $12,000 and Paul was about 15000 maybe a little more because he had also thought this would be a good experience for him to bring along his wife and kids. Mm. <laughs> um, and um, 
course, when, when we signed, uh, then the contract uh, repaid us for, for those expenses, but not until we were out of pocket uh, a while and, and had to take a risk. And again, I, I just want to point out what, it, what it's really like. We set up a, a, a network um, of, of donkey carts. We began uh, building donkey carts out of uh, galvanized water pipe and uh, using axles out of vehicles that were um, burned out military vehicles or other vehicles that, that were um, in, in, in scrap heaps. And then we used drums from food oil. The, the drums, uh, the 50 gallon drums of food oil came from all over the world for the refugee program. And so we um, literally had a chance to take the, um, the, the, the sword kind of thing and beat it into plowshares. Um, Imagine in a country where the average income was uh, 100 to $200, people paid us $400 for a donkey cart. We extended credit and we insisted on being repaid. This caused outrage as well. The idea that we would sell something to a refugee was, um, was outrageous to the people that were uh, um, overseeing our project. But we understood that this needed to happen in order for us to get really the right blend of people using our donkey carts. In, we, we wanted the people who really needed it. And by charging them for it, we got the ones that, that really needed it. So take, for example, there was a woman named Faduma. She was um, taking care of her husband who had been injured in the war. And they lived in a refugee camp in a little hovel. And she took care of his other wife and she had kids, and he had kids by the other wife, and she took care of all of this. She was very entrepreneurial. <coughs> she got a donkey cart from us and paid it back in a matter of months. She got another donkey cart from us with the cash and paid that off. She got a third <coughs> donkey cart from us until she was up to about 10 donkey carts, and she was controlling the distribution of food and water and so on in the refugee camp. When we last spoke with her, she was buying animals and slaughtering them and running a, a, like, a, like a butchery. Mm -hmm. And this was over and above the, the other uh, stuff that she did. Now, now that is a person that you, you want to get a donkey cart into their hands because they are going to make a difference with it. In the end, after three years uh, on our project, uh, we had built uh, a little bit over something in the range of 400 or 450 carts and we had gotten paid back for many of them. We didn't, we didn't get paid back for all of them. And we had a revolving fund. When we got $400 back from someone, um, and as I said, it was done in credit, so it was in payments, but when we got the money back, then we used that money to in fact go and buy more parts and so on and so forth, and we had a revolving fund. At the end of the project, we brought the, uh, the money from the revolving fund back to the UNHCR. And we were delighted because it caused a mini crisis. There was no line item for taking money back. Uh, and so they had to tell Ex Geneva to ask them what to do with the funds that we had repaid. After all those years of income generation, um, I guess it, 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 there, there wasn't that much income actually being generated. And uh, this, this was, this was um, in, a, in a small way, uh, very satisfying to bring them back this money. One of the key things of, about IDE uh, was certainly uh, Paul's ability to see the situation through, through different eyes. And he'll outline some of the other things, but I, I would like to point out that I think that what you were saying before about a certain amount of stubbornness, I think his stubborn desire um, to do what it takes to help the poor left a very big impression on me and it's had a very big impact on IDE and on all of the people who have, um, who have benefited over the last 28 years and it is in, into the millions of people at this point. I'm telling you all of this uh, to <coughs> encourage you. Uh, know that there are opportunities out there and uh, know that uh, you, can, you can make a difference. And with that, I'll um, turn it over to Paul. After we finished our uh, time in Somalia, we got together and started a small company that imported jute rugs from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And we are still doing that 25 years later. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on in the, in the presentation.
So I think a couple of things from Jerry's story that are interesting, especially to an audience of uh, people. How many people here are 24 or younger? So that's the majority. Uh, I won't ask how many are 24 or, or older. Uh, but the thing of it is, when we went to Somalia for the first time, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we still don't. But you can learn uh, if, you, if you go with an open mind and uh, with an interest in looking at opportunities. Uh, that project, and by the way, uh, the other thing, Jerry, that I think is interesting, uh, who built the donkey carts? It was refugee blacksmiths. We recruited six refugee blacksmith shops and they built and sold the donkey carts and we brought in welders and uh, the average cart cost around four hundred dollars but uh, the average return on the donkey cart was two hundred dollars a month which was which made instant millionaires out of uh, 450 people in, in in the local culture okay so now uh, let's go right to some the meat of a more formal presentation and and here's some important information maybe you should take notes uh, uh, for these uh, first few things uh, so I want you to pay attention So here are some of the people who have been my friends and teachers over the last 28 years. By the way, this is Somalia. This is me going on a modern ferry. That's my daughter Catherine with red hair. Uh, uh, my daughter Laura, my daughter Laura uh, to my right. Uh, Art de Fair is in the back with a wild sports shirt and that's his daughter in front of him. And his other daughter is, oh I think this thing has a, yeah. This is Laura, this is his daughter Shanti, this is Tara, this is Art de Fair. And I don't know where you were, Jerry. This is Jerry right here. <laughs> where were you? You were at there. The huh? Oh, you took the picture. That's what happened. Okay. <laughs> this is what the donkey cart, the kind of donkey, and here are some of our donkey carts. By the way, one of the things that Jerry introduced, it was a major engineering breakthrough. Some of you are engineering students. We made a convertible, first, the first big breakthrough was not breaking the donkey's back. The second was donkey carts were used to deliver water and to deliver wood. But it was a different donkey cart with a platform to deliver wood and, and, and bags of things. And it was a 55 gallon drum to deliver water. We developed a convertible donkey cart. We, you could bolt a platform on there and in about Two minutes, you could unbolt it, and there was an undercarriage of leather straps that would hold the. Here's a family that I talk about in the book, uh, Krishna Bahadur Tapa, switching now to the hills, foothills of uh, Nepal. He was uh, a two-acre farmer who earned about fifty to a hundred dollars a year. This is his family. Uh, I didn't find out until a couple of years after I got to know him that he actually had two wives, which I didn't expect, because, but in the hills that's quite uh, uh, possible to do if, uh, if your first wife doesn't have kids, and he married his first wife's sister. Now, I've talked to my wife Aggie about her sister, but uh, she wasn't uh, too keen on that. Uh, as I describe in the book, he went from 50 bucks a year he had a stream 
and uh, a development organization had put a water pipe to his house which ran about a, a, a 3 8 inch pipe of water 24 hours, which is much more than the household needs, but not enough to, to water vegetables. He heard about a low-cost drip system. He invested $26, I think, in a, a system that covered about a 16th of an acre. He earned 250 bucks and never looked back. And five years later, that family's income was $4,800 a year which was way beyond, it was more than uh, most of the IDE uh, Nepali staff members were uh, earning. This is his son checking the low-cost drip system. Here's a group of typical farmers in, in uh, Nepal. This is a patch of, uh, of uh, vegetables irrigated by a treadle pump. This is not a gay marriage, actually. This is a couple of farmers in Africa. <coughs> this is a seedling nursery irrigated by a turtle pup. And you plant the vegetables out. This is a guy in India in an area that were specialists in vegetables, and that's his son. And uh, uh, they used to irrigate those vegetables with a counterbalance bucket, and the treadle pump made, the, uh, made it possible to grow a half acre of vegetables, which uh, uh, eventually tripled this guy's income. Here's a drip irrigation system. You see those uh, things that look like garbage tanks, uh, garbage pails, they, they're gravity tanks and the, and the water comes out with pipes. This is a drip system in Nepal. So this is just to give you a sense of the kind of people we're talking about. The most important thing, the most important contribution I made to IDE was I had been an entrepreneur as well as a physician. And any successful entrepreneur knows that you've got to know your customers. And so I made a commitment at the very beginning, 28 years ago, that I would talk in some de depth to at least 100 one-acre farmers a year. These are one-acre farmers who live on less than a dollar a day. Those were our primary customers. So I've done that from the beginning. Um, but that means not an, an office interview. It means walking with them through their fields, getting to know their families. Uh, my routine is to spend most of a day with one typical farm family and then spend a couple of hours with another 15 or 20 in the village. At the end of that, I rarely come, uh, come away without at least one breakthrough idea that we come up with together. Uh, so that's basically, it's, it's, these are the kind of people that I've been learning from. And in the book, I talk about the 12 steps to practical problem solving. The first three are the most important. Any social problem, not poverty, and, and not just poverty, homelessness, whatever. Go to where the action is, number one. Talk to the people who have the problem, number two, and actually listen. But the listening is a lot, is, is the most important part of that, because it's not listening to the words, it's listening with your whole body and soul, uh, seeing how they're dressed, seeing who they are, learning about their lives. People say, how can you learn anything when you sometimes don't speak the language? And I say, because 10% of the information is the words. The rest is what you see and hear and absorb and understand. And that's all in, in what listening means. So my contention is, that if you really know how to keep your eyes and ears and soul open, you can walk through a village once and write a book. But I'm talking about seeing what people carry in their hands. 
how many people are riding around in bicycles as opposed to carrying stuff on their backs? What kind of trucks are there? What kind of, do people ride motorcycles? Do they wear helmets? Uh, do, uh, are there a lot of TV antennas? Uh, do the houses have uh, thatched roofs? You see what I'm saying? There are formal interview structures, but if you learn to really listen, everything comes from that. You don't start by having an idea to help people. You start by listening and learning from them. Not teaching them, but learning from them. This is what I was trying to say in, in our discussion before. So a little bit about IDE and uh, uh, what it eventually developed into after this first year. It's now an organization with some 450 staff in nine developing countries. Uh, about 13 of those staff are in headquarters. The rest are all in the field and they're virtually all local people. So the people in India are in, uh, Indian staff. Uh, from the beginning we never had uh, uh, as a general rule, more than one foreigner in any country. And here are, I'm a great believer in all development programs having a measurable impact and being scalable or else don't bother. So applying that same, can you, can you read that or is it, oh yeah, it's pretty small. I'll, I'll, I can read it to you. This is a basic uh, cost and impact of IDE over the first 25 years. IDE over 25 years got 78 million dollars in grants, contributions, some from CETA, some from Europe. And I said at the beginning that we treat poor people as customers instead of recipients of charity. Do people who live on a dollar a day themselves invested over a three-year period 138 million over a 25-year period over a 25-year period but uh, it's not a, a one-time thing each of them that's over a three-year period so a, a farmer might buy a treadle pump and then might add something else uh, so it's it, it, it's 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 a three-year investment but over 25 years dollar a day people as customers invested 139 million of their own money in our technologies and in the services that we provided at a fair market value without subsidy except for a marketing subsidy which was fairly small and they in turn are now earning 288 million dollars a year net from their investment that's the kind of power of the marketplace that is there uh, lying untapped. And all of you have uh, uh, the potential of doing something to tap that uh, tremendous potential. Let me pause there for, for just a few minutes in, uh, uh, in case some of you have some questions or reactions to what I've said so far. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah. Well, you said the farmers are living on a dollar a day, and what's the question? What's that? I didn't understand how a farmer is living on a dollar a day. Isn't they planting their own land? Do they get Yeah, okay, so. Uh, the question is, how does a farmer live on a dollar a day and do they have their own land and how is that all that possible? So, uh, let me give some basic background. There, there are a little over six billion people in the world, right? Of those, 1.1 billion live on less than a dollar a day. 1.1 billion of the people in the world today live on less than a dollar a day. Uh, 2.4 billion live on less than two dollars a day. Well, let me just add a couple of things and then you can ask. Uh, of the dollar a day people, 75% earn their primary income from one acre farms, from small farms in developing countries. And the dollar a day, that's a dollar US. There, there's all kinds of complications about what that means, purchasing power parity, but, but 
generally a dollar U.S. is maybe worth five dollars in purchasing power. But, but uh, the family truly lives on a dollar a day. That means that, and, they, and, and uh, about 65-70% uh, of them do own an acre of land that they inherited. The others are landless laborers, so-called landless, but landless is defined in funny ways. Uh, a lot of, uh, I think India, you got, uh, anybody under a quarter acre is landless, but with a, with a drip system and intensive horticulture, you can earn $1,000 net from a quarter acre growing off-season crops. So I don't regard that functionally as landless. So now, ask your question again. I don't know if I've uh, given you the background to this. How can he live on a dollar a day if he plants his own food? Yeah, because he plants his own food, he or she are able to provide their own Okay, but, 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 you, but you, you need more than just food, don't you, to survive? Oh, okay, so uh, let, 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 let's, let's give some examples of, of, of families. First of all, a family has a, 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 an acre of land in four or five scattered plots. They are urged by the development community to grow rice, wheat, and corn so that they have enough food to eat. But uh, that acre, not all of it can grow. Let's say rice is the main staple food crop. Not all the people, not all that land will grow rice. Maybe they have a quarter acre of rice bottom land. They can't produce, maybe they need seven or eight hundred kilos of rice to feed their family, uh, or a thousand kilos. Uh, but they're only producing 700, so they go hungry three months a year or have one meal a day. Uh, some of them, if they're growing surplus rice, sell it in the market and earn some cash. Uh, some of them grow fruits and vegetables, but they're dependent on the rainfall. And the rainfall comes during the rainy season. Everybody else is growing fruits and vegetables. That's good to eat, but the price is so low because the market is flooded that they can't make too much money. So generally then they look for work and they may get hired on a, on a neighboring farm for a buck a day and one meal of rice. Uh, so they bring in, and, and if, they, if they have sons, the sons go and work and bring in some money. So Krishna Bahadur Tapa uh, had, was lucky to have a one acre of bottom land that was not irrigated, but it grew enough rice to feed his family and occasionally had some surplus. Then he and his sons would look for seasonal work, and that's how they were making 50 or or $100. But you need more than just what to eat. If your wife is sick with pneumonia and may die, you want to go get some medicines to keep her from dying. You see what I mean? And, and so there are a lot of things like that that are beyond food uh, at, the, at the survival. Does, does that give you a, a, a picture? So part of the thing we did then is two things. One is you help farmers grow more rice, wheat, and corn from the land they have that produces it. You can do that with very simple things, like uh, you have nodules of, uh, if, if a farmer wants to get a better yield of rice, they uh, uh, broadcast nitrogen, usually like a, 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 in, in some kind of ammonia form, uh, and they do it three or four times a year, but a lot of it runs off in the rainfall and some of it gases off. There is a way of making a nodule, it's like a sustained rele uh, release medicine. It's a, it's a nodule of, of the nitrogen. The farmer pokes a stick between four rice plants, puts a nodule in, and that stays, it doesn't run off, and it gives about a 15% increase in yield of rice, uh, and a little bit less cost for, for fertilizer. So using stuff like that, you can increase the income, help them increase their income 
uh, increase the food, but most of them are still food deficient. The reality is if they can grow higher value crops in the off season, that's usually the dry season. In the dry season, not as many people can grow uh, fruits and vegetables and, and, and uh, herbs. If they could get water control in the dry season, they could get three times the money. The reason that Krishna Bauru Tapa, the guy that I talked about, made 250 bucks from a sixteenth of an acre is because he planted off-season cauliflower and cucumber. The hills of Nepal had a climate that would allow them to grow that in the off-season and India couldn't grow it then. So they could get two or three times the price and it was the drip irrigation system that made it possible. You see what I'm saying? Does, it, does that clarify things for people? Uh, any other uh, quick questions and I'll go, yes. Some of them were 300 pounds, some of them were 55 pounds. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know, I'm just being a smart ass. Uh, <laughs> what size of population? We, uh, uh, we okay, uh, it was 3 million families, it's about 17 million people. Uh, IDE now has reached uh, something like 3.7 million families. Yes. I'm wondering if you could comment on any Whoop. I just screwed up the mic. Uh, the, oh, well, you can you can fix it. I'm sorry. When you have these families who are suddenly making that much more income, what happened to their relationships with people who maybe weren't involved in the projects or extended family who remained poor? Okay, so uh, the question is what happened, uh, people make, make more money, what happened in their relationships to other people in the village and in their family? Well, that's culturally determined. In Somalia, people dreaded making more money from the donkey carts because they were obligated to uh, spread the wealth for the whole extended family. Uh, so uh, that's both good and bad. So there are all kinds of things that happened about that. Uh, uh, people in Somalia, uh, it's a Muslim culture, and they, uh, a man often had three wives and three families. So you can imagine the kind of stuff that goes on. But, but part of the thing about talking to 3,000 people is to talk to them and see what they, what they actually did do. And, and for them, uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, if, if you ask people, what do you do with the extra money? First thing they do is, if, if their family is going hungry, they buy the food they need. Now, now the economics is this. You grow a, a quarter acre of rice, and it might go a long way to feeding your family. If you grow off-season fruits and vegetables with low-cost drip irrigation and a treadle pump, you can earn a thousand bucks. That will buy you a hell of a lot more rice than you can possibly grow. You see what I mean? So the, uh, uh, but, but people are risk averse. These are people that are risk averse, so they're not going to go for stuff like that. They'll always put first priority on growing the food they need. But as they l start to learn about diversified crops and lowering the risk and, and they gain some experience and they start with simple things like kale, which is easy to grow but is lousy uh, price, they then, uh, then go to the higher price things, and after a while, they're more confident in how much money they can make with diversified high-value crops than they are about rice. So, so that's, that's the whole thing. Okay, yes? Uh, one of the barriers, I think, to starting those sort of enterprises is the initial capital. I just yeah. wondered if you had, you had a microfinance component to it, but because you also mentioned that most of the people so far you've shown us are men, whereas microfinance tends to be heavily favored towards women entrepreneurship. I just wanted to... Okay. Uh, again, this is a culture... It, it, the, the, uh, Bangladesh, the men are at least... Uh, they front as the power, but in many ways they are the power. In that culture, uh, a woman on a treadle pump, sometimes in the, in the dry season, 
the pumping was done by women, my gosh, we're running out of time. Whew, there's a lot more. No, keep going. Okay. Uh, so, f for instance, a woman is not expected to go to the market. If she is pumping the treadle pump, she needs to have put a screen around her so she's not obscenely visible to the public. Mm -hmm. If the treadle pump needs a spare part, she can't go to the market and get it. Uh, over time, that created a big cultural change because the income is so important. Uh, but... Uh, In Bangladesh, I mean, Muhammad Yunus, when he started, all these people wanted to do things, but they, they didn't have the money to start. Okay, so, so uh, 20 years ago, we did a partnership with Grameen Bank, and they sold 25,000 treadle pumps. But, but uh, every one of these things is more complicated than it is on the surface. In a lot of countries, the rule is women have to apply. So if you're an absolute... Uh, autocrat husband and there's a loan available you order your wife to go get the loan and you're in control of it uh, not all loans end up generating income that said the microenterprise movement is a is a very important force for positive uh, uh, change out of poverty uh, okay uh, the time has fled uh, how, do, how do you want to proceed um, Okay, um, I want to, well, okay, I'll, I'll go through some of this uh, more quickly, but I'll give you an idea of what it takes to make one of these projects work. Here's the treadle pump as an example. In Bangladesh, where we started with the treadle pump, uh, pretty much all the land in the dry, most of the crops are grown in two rainy seasons. In the dry season, there's water 12 feet below your feet, but very few crops are grown. The treadle pump is like a stairmaster. You can uh, suck up enough water through a tube well that goes down 40 feet to the sand layer to irrigate half an acre of vegetables in the dry season. You don't worry about floods. So the treadle pump cost eight bucks. Uh, it was invented by a guy who wanted to build a pump that would sell for a sack of rice, Gunnar Barnes. Um, and we took on the job of mass marketing it because on the average from a treadle pump, a person who, a farmer who invested $25 would earn $100 net in the first year, and one-fifth of the farmers earned $500 net. They were the better farmers. So here's how we mass-marketed the treadle pump in Bangladesh. We enlisted a, a system of 75 little workshops that manufactured the treadle pumps. Uh, we paid them nothing. They did it purely uh, to uh, make money as a business. We recruited 3,000 village dealers and we did a training program, three-day course with a diploma for uh, three or 4,000 well drillers who, who also drilled the wells and installed the pumps uh, uh, to make a living. Uh, this is what a village dealer looks like in Bangladesh. And if you look closely, there are literally millions of shops like this in villages all over the world. That is a huge resource that is untapped. You notice that uh, uh, there's some yellow cans there. There's a dust uh, beer. Uh, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, dust pan. Yeah, a dust pan. Uh, there, there's some treadle pumps. Uh, he's selling a variety of things. This is a typical little shop that makes a living selling things. So we recruited two or 3,000 of those. Uh, this is a, a guy in, in Zambia, one of our staff, doing a demonstration to... Uh, about treadle pumps to people, to farmers who are interested. Here is a, uh, uh, a typical workshop. It's not an Alice Chambers factory. Uh, you notice the OSHA uh, regulation footwear. Uh, and that guy's welding the junction box on the bottom of a, of a treadle pump. Now comes the marketing, which is a critical piece. Some of you may have heard this story, but basically, so we, we the challenge uh, uh, in design was how to design uh, communication and marketing of treadle pumps since they did a lot of good in a, in a culture where uh, half the people were illiterate and there are no mass media. So we recruited village troubadours. There are quite a few of them. It's uh, troubadours. These are people that go around and sing and make, make songs and perform at, uh, at uh, festivals and at markets. They wrote a song about the treadle pump. They have a little orchestra. Here they are playing at a farmer's market. 
uh, uh, the song is about the treadle pump. In the corner, there's a guy pumping a treadle pump, which circulates water. Uh, another guy is handing out leaflets saying, if you want to buy a treadle pump, go to Honest Sam's. But uh, it was tough to reach a big enough audience with small troubadour groups, so we decided to create, uh, to produce and, 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 and uh, create a 90-minute Bollywood movie. Uh, and so we hired a guy uh, who was working for a marketing firm in the capital of uh, Bangladesh, Dhaka. We decided what the key messages were that we wanted to communicate. Uh, a Bollywood movie in, uh, in Bangladesh, a typical one, has a, a, uh, a wedding, a, a near suicide, a funeral, and lots of singing and dancing. So. Uh, this, this movie, uh, and by the way, uh, every time we showed a movie, people, there would be an advertising campaign. These are mic'd rickshaws, which create nerve deafness at an alarming rate. No, you've, if you've been to the rural villages, you know how those, uh, but they say, come this evening, and you see these guys are on treadle pumps, and uh, you're going to enjoy yourself. And here is... Uh, the actual moving, it's a movie, it's in an open air setting. Uh, the average crowd uh, ca that came was three to 5,000. Uh, it's run off a generator. To, to produce that movie cost $25,000. We had the best uh, director in Bangladesh, the top male lead, the top female lead. The, the basic plot was boy meets girl, they want to get married, they can't get married because the father doesn't have enough money for the dowry. So she falls into the clutches of a dowry bandit, uh, near suicide, weeping, gnashing of teeth. And then there's an intermission in which each of our staff, the staff in each area that are IDE staff, that are both technicians and promoters, have uh, organized the dealers in the area to bring their best potential customers to the movie. During the intermission, the customers get on treadle pumps, try them out, uh, they, they make more connections. And then after the intermission, the movie goes on. The father meets a, a school friend who tells him about the treadle pump. <laughs> he buys a treadle pump, makes lots of money, they get married and live happily ever afterwards. <laughs> so a little hokey, but uh, uh, that played to an audience of a million people a year. Uh, treadle pumps were unknown, so we, it was like a politician without name rec recognition. Now, I, I, I'm... I'm I always talk about this because design to me is not just design of irrigation or technology. The biggest problem is designing the scale, reaching millions. And to do that, you've got to design a creative rural mass marketing program. Uh, in the end, with a treadle pump alone, we sold 2.1 million treadle pumps, 1.5 million in Bangladesh. But we didn't sell them. The, the uh, ne private sector network that we stimulated sold them. Uh, and and it, it, it results like you saw in the, uh, in, the, in the other screen. This is a drip irrigation system. It's the same deal. Drip irrigation is the most stingy way of delivering water to plants. Uh, it started in Israel, but uh, uh, only 1% of global irrigated acreage is drip irrigation because it's too big and too expensive and we couldn't talk the big companies into making a small affordable uh, a range of small affordable drip irrigation systems so we did it ourselves uh, we won't have time to talk about this but this is a drip irrigation system it's a kitchen garden system that plastic bag will hold one bucket full of water a woman who normally carries two buckets of water a day can carry a couple of extra buckets a drip irrigate a 250 square foot. Oh, you guys talk in meters. So it's, a, it's a, like a 20 square meter plot, which is enough to significantly improve the uh, diet of her family with micronutrients, uh, vitamins, minerals, and so on. But with that $3 investment, she can earn $10 from selling the excess in the market. And it's designed so you can expand it like a Lego set. So she can use another $3 from the $10 and double the size and eventually get to as big as she wants to get to. So we have drip irrigation systems. You saw one in the, in, in the, in the shots that go up to two acres. And that, that's another form of irrigation. There's a whole host of affordable small plot irrigation devices. 
Now, I think I can get to the wrap up pretty quick. And this uh, will include a three minute video that will put you to sleep, uh, which will make it easy to end the talk. Uh, what I've done uh, since I handed over ID, I've stayed on the board, but I've started these two new organizations. One is an organization to create a revolution in design for the other 90% of people in the world who are bypassed by the design process and by the marketplace to a large extent. A little bit about the revolution in design. Uh, I've been working to help develop courses. One of them is a course at Stanford called Design for Extreme Affordability. We've worked on that for five years. It's now uh, a course, it's an elective for graduate students. Amy Smith has another one called uh, D-Lab. It's for undergraduates. She has 30 students every year do this. Uh, at, at Stanford, uh, we uh, work with the uh, design uh, uh, center, but it is a course that brings together students, graduate students from business, engineering, uh, health sciences, and the humanities. Um, Forty students get in, they form multidisciplinary teams, and at the end, they are expected, they're graded on, the outputs of the course are, they got to come up with a transformative tool or a strategy, a viable business plan that is persuasive to the venture capitalists who attend the final presentations, and an effective communications package, including an elevator pitch um, and a, a video or a PowerPoint. A lot of these teams then uh, actually follow up and form an, a nonprofit or a business uh, and this is, but the first step, uh, it, all these things that I've been talking about are incorporated. The students, a half of the students go to the village and talk to poor people in order to come up with what they're going to work on. This is a student operating a, uh, a s typical sprinkler system in Myanmar. And here's an example of an end product. This is called Embrace. Um, Premature infants have a problem maintaining their temperature so that we use incubators in this country to keep their temperature up. They cost eight or ten grand. They're often contributed to countries like Nepal where they're out of commission in, in, in uh, six months. But the incubator uh, has problems working in a rural area with no electricity. So they designed this system called Embrace. It cost $25. It's a little sleeping bag with a bag of face change material just like you put uh, into your freezer to keep the picnic basket cool. Only this uses wax which changes phase at body temperature. So the mother takes the premature infant, holds it against her skin, uh, takes the package of wax, puts it against a, a vessel of hot water that's been heated on the stove. In 15 minutes it absorbs the heat. You put that package into the sleeping bag and the infant is kept at body temperature for five hours when you do it again. Now, will that work? We don't know. They, they got $500,000 in prizes and investments and they're trying it out. And uh, uh, DREV is helping them. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is a revolution in big business. And... Uh, Jerry, what he didn't talk about, I'm not sure we have time now. Uh, <clears throat> while we were doing uh, the donkey cart project, we stopped in Bangladesh and we saw these very interesting jute carpets. Uh, that created a business that Jerry runs now in St. Jacob's. He's right in your area, uh, selling uh, several million dollars a year of carpets. And we picked jute. Uh, uh, because it was so important a crop to uh, small farmers in Bangladesh. But that is a very successful business. It's made yearly contributions to IDE, which has kept IDE going. Uh, but the idea is, can you make a viable business and combine it with a development objective? Now, I want to show you, as a wrap-up, what I'm working on now. Windhorse International is designed to act actually be the multinational corporation for development that we talked about at the very beginning. And it starts off 
with one of the products is to provide access to safe drinking water for the billion people in the world that don't have it. And we thought of a way of doing this. Uh, I won't demonstrate the technology because we're short on time. But there's a very simple way of, uh, that's inexpensive of creating chlorine out of table salt or any salt. You take a 5% brine solution, run an electric current through it, and you get unstable chlorine. So you can chlorinate unsafe drinking water. So our idea to start with was that we would create a kiosk that looks something like this that would sell water to people at about three cents uh, for 10 liters, which is enough for the average family for a day. Uh, and it would be with a kiosk like this. Then we made the mistake of going to India and talking to people. Uh, this is Amitabha Sadangi, the head of IDE India. This is me with my trusty video camera. Uh, and we're talking to people. And what we learned is that no way would that work. People uh, are in villages, people from one village, even if it's cross, if it's within a hundred meters, won't go to another village because of cultural factors. Also, in rural India, uh, uh, people, um, the typical village is a hundred to three hundred households. Uh, it's a, really a hamlet. So we had to get down in size. So here is a video, which is three minutes, that describes the process. There are a billion people in the world who don't have access to safe drinking water. Between two and three hundred million of them live in rural villages in eastern India, where less than five percent of families use latrines. When the torrential monsoon rains come, they spread fecal bacteria and viruses uniformly through the countryside, permeating the topsoil and the shallow groundwater with disease-producing pathogens. But the only source of drinking water people in rural eastern India have is shallow open wells, village ponds, and shallow tube wells, all of which are totally polluted. Winters International, a private company formed to demonstrate profitability serving poor customers, and IDE India, a development organization helping millions of small farmers move out of poverty, have joined forces to form a private sector initiative to supply safe drinking water to poor families in eastern India for four cents a day. Less than what they spend now for the medicines and clinic visits to treat the dysentery and other diseases they get from the water they drink now. The plan to produce safe drinking water is simple. We will treat it with chlorine just as we do in the West, and we'll get the chlorine by running a small amount of electric current through a 5% solution of salt water. Since salt water has, is sodium chloride, it releases chlorine, which it can be used to sterilize the drinking water. The big challenge is delivering safe drinking water to scattered villages where people without it live. In this part of India, there are half a billion people, uh, and they are already served by millions of tiny shops in villages selling everything from bananas to soap to tobacco. We will contract with some of these shops, and we will build for them a 1,000 liter, $40 concrete water storage tank where we will treat the water to make it safe and the shopkeeper will charge four cents a day uh, for women to fill their water vessels. And can I see one of those so that this will provide shopkeepers with a dollar a day in new income, but more importantly, many new customers visiting their shop every day to buy water. We will demonstrate that it's possible to create new profitable markets selling affordable products and services to people who live on less than two dollars a day and help them move out of poverty in the process. So that's a description <clears throat> of what we're working on now. The beta test, that is, the field test to do this, we're going to 
set up uh, 20 of these micro kiosks and run them for six months and learn what's wrong with the idea. And uh, uh, we have a whole bunch of other ideas. But in the end, the real potential in this is to have several hundred thousand private sector shelf space shops where we can move product to rem people, customers in remote villages. And this will be, go way beyond drinking water. It'll include uh, a whole bunch of other products that, that we will design or make use of. And it will create, and this may be a little bit of a controversial term, but it will create the micro Walmarts of the future. So with that, I'd like to end by saying all it takes is one person with a dream, and that person may be you. Thank you very much. Quarter to nine, uh, perhaps we can take two or three questions, and then there's students, there's free food, you better stock up. Um, you all live on less than a dollar a day around here. Um, and then you could, if there are more questions for Paul, you could scrum around him and, uh, and, and I'm sure he'll accommodate as many as he can. So two or three each. And by the way, I'll be around to sign the book if anybody oh, yeah. wants and a book right, signing. Book signing also. So E, so, can you, I'll t we'll take all three questions. Is that okay? Sure. And then, and then he'll answer them. Okay, so I just have two the first question is, um, I mean, coming from a developing country and having um, gone through the education system, these are not technically things that are taught in schools. So what plans does ID have to have these skills taught in schools so Africans can actually do the work you're doing now? Um, the second question I have is with regards to how replicable the plans are. So for example, um, in your water trading um, um, with the water trading investment, that might apply to say um, farmers in Bangladesh. But say farmers in Africa aren't exactly facing the problem of productivity, but they're facing the problem of finding appropriate markets for their products. So how replicable are the products are? And one last question is about patents, right? So how is about what issues patents? So the people who oh. produce these products, what do they get for it? What? How do you protect their intellectual property? I said I was going to take three questions. So. Now, there you go. And this is, this is a test of my approaching senility. See if I can remember the questions. Uh, one of the things is that uh, didn't get a chance. You can never cover uh, enough uh, in, in one interaction. Uh, IDE works currently in Ethiopia, in Zimbabwe, uh, and in Zambia. Turtle pumps actually work very well in Africa. Uh, other, since, since this has been introduced, there are other organizations. There's an organization called Kickstart. They've sold uh, 90,000 treadle pumps in Kenya and Tanzania. FAO is selling treadle pumps. We've sold treadle pumps in Africa. It's, it's more challenging. Sub-Saharan Africa is more challenging. Expenses uh, are higher. Patents. Uh, I think you have to have an intellectual property strategy that is product specific. With treadle pumps, our approach was anybody can take our designs and make use of them. But in order to make a company like what I talked about with Waterwork, uh, you have to be competitive in the, in the marketplace. The first thing is, in most developing countries, if, if your product is any good, it'll be knocked off in two weeks. That's true in Bangladesh. I'm not sure how long it takes in Africa. Maybe it'll take three weeks. Uh, so uh, really what we're doing uh, with this is the Coca-Cola strategy. Coca-Cola uses a secret recipe, which is sugar, water, and some kind of other crap in there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Pepsi does the same thing. Uh, we will... Uh, create a water purifying product that our staff will take around to the uh, various kiosks and we'll make a deal with the kiosks so that they can make money but we'll stay in control of the secret formula and it's no more a secret formula than Coca-Cola's recipe is a secret recipe. As they have found out, a lot of people uh, have uh, uh, 
uh, done uh, soft drinks in very effective competition, but Coca-Cola still sells, and so does Pepsi because of the marketing. Mm -hmm. And now, did I miss a, What was the third? Two out of three is pretty good. Okay. <laughs> yes. What are the challenges of doing this work? You got to, as, 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 as was stated in the beginning, you've got to be pretty stubborn. Uh, one of the challenges is that it flies in the face of what development approaches are now. In my view, uh, and I'm not the only one, but uh, 20 years ago uh, there weren't too many people saying this. Uh, all the money we've invested in sub-Saharan Africa in development has essentially been wasted. We've spent three billion, uh, a trillion dollars in sub-Saharan Africa with very little to show for it. I think that uh, current things don't work. Uh, I, I spent five years trying to get the World Bank to get interested in creating affordable small plot irrigation. People were very interested, individuals were very interested. I got absolutely nowhere. The whole current infrastructure of development in which uh, money goes, 80% of the billion dollars a year in formal development funds go through multilaterals and bilaterals, meaning they go through governments of developing countries. That, uh, the rationale for that strategy is understandable, but it has totally failed. I feel it's got to be, uh, be reversed, uh, and 80% of the money for development should go to grassroots Anybody at the grassroots, any individual or organization that can show measurable positive impact and scalability. And of course that'll never happen, it's politically impossible, just as it's impossible to eliminate farm subsidies which are just indecent in terms of the world situation. But, but they're continuing and you can't really eliminate them. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges and, and I think that part of the challenge is the first biggest challenge is uh, people are not used to starting by listening to the poor people themselves. That's a huge thing. If you can do that, uh, but then you've got to have a lot of determination and you've got to be willing to change on a dime 180 degrees and do it six times. Uh, I, I illustrated that with, uh, we, we came up with a concept that seemed good from what we had learned, but it really didn't work in India, so we changed it. And I have no doubt that before the six months are up, we'll change everything dramatically again. So if you're willing to do that and continue learning, I think a lot of the challenges can be overcome. This is a chlorine pure for purifier. It's made for, by, for campers uh, by a company called Cascade Design. It has one tiny battery. Uh, the reason that we picked this, there are, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm technology agnostic about water, but, the, but uh, the unit we'll use will cost $250, will produce enough chlorine liquid to sterilize 80,000 liters of water a day, and we'll use less than a dollar's worth of electricity plugged into a, an electric circuit at normal rates. It is about a third of the cost of ultraviolet in terms of electricity use. Those, that's how you pick something. You've got to look at all those things and the simplicity. Of course, there are problems with chlorine. People are concerned about environmental hazards. There have been studies that show that it creates some, uh, some toxic elements sometimes. But uh, no development project is positive. It's always positive and negative, and you want to have the positive significantly outweigh the negatives. Uh, people are dying from the diseases they get from bad drinking water. The negative effects of using chlorine are, in my view, totally outweighed by that being, right now, the cheapest way of purifying water that has uh, fecal pathogens in it. Uh, five to nine, I think that's uh, time to wrap up. So once more, can we uh, thank Paul for... <laughs>